Fanny Mayo, my colleague, who's going to get us started on promising practices that we identified. Thanks very much, Eduardo. Um, okay, so the community scan that we did for this project identified several community groups and organizations across Ontario that provide important services and support to migrant agricultural workers across the province. And so amidst government policy and practice and efficiency and failures, these groups uh, have served as key safety nets for workers during the pandemic by providing essential resources and goods, including food, prepared meals, grocery, clothing, work gear, and COVID-19 safety supplies, such as hand sanitizers, masks, and respirators. These groups also offer workers important opportunities to socialize and build community. Community support groups have also played an integral role in seeking and reorganizing information on COVID-19 policies, practices, and key safety messaging to ensure that this information reaches farm workers in Ontario in accessible formats that recognize both language and literacy barriers. It's important to note that community groups also play a role in connecting workers to healthcare and assisting health centers provide service to this population. As reflected in our regional scan and through the project structured interviews, Ontario has a very active network of community support groups that provide information, resources, and support to workers. And this network is an important and promising practice in supporting farm workers in Ontario. We also identified a variety of community spaces in regions across the province. And these are dedicated community spaces for migrant agricultural workers to visit. They offer workers access to in-person services and support, as well as provide them opportunities to socialize and connect to other workers and to community members as well. Um, community spaces often host events and activities, and they can provide workers with a sense of place, belonging, and community outside of their normal spaces of their workplace and shared housing. Some of the promising practices that we identified uh, include the Farm Worker Hub in Niagara-on-the-Lake. This is a place workers can visit to get clothing and other essential items. It is a volunteer community-driven initiative. Um, also, the Center for Migrant Worker Solidarity in downtown Simcoe, an area that hosts many thousands of workers every year. Um, and this is an important place that workers can stop by to access services and information when they're in town. Also in Bradford, we noted that there is a space for international agricultural workers run by a group called Unknown Neighbours. And so recognizing that in Ontario, um, there's an anti-Black racism strategy uh, that recognizes that Black communities across the province face stigma and stereotypes that have impacted public policies, decision-making, and services. Um, and Black communities in Ontario live a shared present-day experience of anti-Black racism. This impacts Black worker communities in unique ways. Some community support groups in Ontario provide specialized services and supports to Black Caribbean farm workers. Although these groups are a minority in the province and they are not found in all areas where black farm workers are living and working, we do see them as a best practice. Um, where they do operate, the presence and work done by these groups um, is essential toward providing black workers a sense of safe community and space. Um, and such groups also offer workers, um, specifically in terms of their services, religious supports but also activities for leisure and recreation and targeted healthcare services. The promising practices we identified in our scan include the Caribbean Workers Outreach Program, the Niagara Workers Welcome, and Southridge Community Church. We also noted um, the funding and provincial coordination and network building activities undertaken by Kairos as a best practice. Um, and that's because in December of 2020, the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program awarded Kairos $2.18 million to support and assist workers arriving in Ontario. And with this, Kairos created its Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers During COVID-19 project and distributed funding to six initial partners and community organizations working with migrant farm workers. Phase one of the project ran from December 17, 2020 to July 31st, 2021. Key activities of this project and the work of its funded partners included outreach activities to connect workers um, and provide them with key information and guidance, specifically guidance on COVID-19 and related policies, which were ever updating and changing. And this was done directly via phone or workshops and through the development and distribution of informational materials, including videos and hand handouts. Funded groups were also providing direct support and accompaniment to workers in accessing services and benefits, including healthcare. 
also in accessing their legal rights and emergency assistance if needed. The funded groups also distributed welcome bags to workers across the province that contained many practical items, including hand sanitizers, snacks, um, toiletries, personal care items. And in May 2021, Kairos added airport support services for workers arriving to Toronto Pearson International Airport, through which staff welcomed arriving workers and provided them information on COVID-19 policies and practices, as well as information on additional topics of relevance. Um, in total, phase two included the funding of additional partners, making it a total of 15 funded partners um, who partook in this project. Now, as Eduardo mentioned, fear of injury and illness was a dominant theme that came out of interviews with workers, um, and it really is uh, a, a dominant challenge for workers to process their precarity and their risk um, in the context of their employment here. And so Ontario legal clinics emerged as an important promising practice. Um, and this is because many workers lack access to information on their rights. And so that's their rights related to employment, as well as immigration, income, human rights. Um, they also lack financial resources and they are structurally disempowered to make claims on their rights due to their precarious immigration and employment status. And this means that workers require support when seeking recourse when their rights have been violated. Ontario legal clinics can help workers address legal situations that can contribute to stress, anxiety, and a sense of disempowerment, and to situations that pose a risk to their physical and mental health. Workers have reported widespread stress and anxiety around injury or illness. And so the work of legal clinics like IAVGO um, are crucial in supporting workers in cases of workplace injuries and illnesses and helping workers navigate the very complicated workers' compensation system in Ontario. And with that, I'll now hand it over to my project teammate, Cynthia De La Mora, who will discuss a few more. So another of the promising practices that we found was the Ontario International Agricultural Workers Advocacy Groups. These groups are extremely important, and this project uh, found out on, and considers their, it, they are a very important piece on this whole process, this whole program. They consider, we consider that the engagement with these advocacy groups is extremely important. These groups include international agricultural workers members who share their experiences and concerns and the situation they, they have encountered. This project suggests that it's crucial to listen and pay attention to these voices. We, uh, they have years of experience working and with and advocating for these workers, these communities. Both groups that we see on the slides, Justicia for Migrant Workers, which is also called Justicia, and Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, MWAC, they demand permanent residency status for these workers upon arrival to end the restrictions placed on them based on their status. And this, and this way, they, uh, they will be addressing the existing power imbalance experienced by these workers. This project team reached out to both of these advocacy groups and invited them to participate in project interviews. However, neither of them accepted. Both expressed um, like their concern about the project funding and the provincial government's commitment to a structural change, which they identify as required to actually improve the situation for international agricultural workers in Ontario. However, again, it's important to have them in to account when making these changes and to hear what they have to say, like check the reports, check the complaints they have filled out over the years to have uh, that those views into account. Another practice that we found is the Ontario um, Community Health Centers. Uh, many of these health centers uh, report that besides attending to physical health issues, they also report to mental health symptoms and issues among these workers as well. These centers engage in service provision to and care for international agricultural workers communities often are understanding the stressors faced by these workers. However, some centers recognize that their services reach is limited and question the ability for other workers to access services. Important changes and efforts are being made to serve these workers better, like mobile clinics and different delivery models as well. As an example of these uh, community health centers, we consider Taipu is one of, uh, of extreme importance. 
Taibu Community Health Center is a multidisciplinary not-for-profit community-led organization established to serve Black community across the greater Toronto area. Aims to improve and promote and protect the health and well-being of Black populations. Taibu Community Health Center provides clients with access to culturally designed quality health care, health promotion, and the six disease prevention programs and strategies in a culturally affirming environment. The examples of the mental health support they provide by these uh, groups, like to both of these groups, Caribbean agricultural workers and Black communities, as well as their leadership in health care and mental health of Black communities, supports the recognition of Taibu as an important stakeholder in the development of health and mental health services and supports for Black in international agricultural workers in Ontario. Um, also, uh, another practice, of course, is existing mental health services, CMHA. Uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association is the most established and extensive community mental health organization in Canada. Uh, CMHA recognizes that mental health in the agricultural industry is of growing concern. The nature of agricultural work often results in farmers and producers putting their work above their mental health well-being. Rates of stress, mental health issues, and suicide are much higher among people who work in the agricultural sector compared to the general population. In response to this, um, CMHA has partnered with OMAFRA and the Ontario Federation of Agriculture to direct mental health initiatives specialized to support those in the agricultural sector sector. This uh, center on three identified programs, the ones that we see on the slide, in the Know Farmer Wellness Initiative and the Warden Network. These three programs are centered to attend farmers. For example, the Farmers Wellness Initiative is a program that offers uh, farmers and mem members of their family access to up to uh, four free counseling sessions with a mental health professional who has received training to understand the unique needs of Ontario farmers and it's accessible 24 7. Uh, we also encountered that CMHA has been collaborating with other uh, health centers like the Windsor Essex uh, Health Center and they've been uh, providing at work training and sessions so we consider that CMHA is experiencing with this content signals an opportunity to consider contextualizing this for agricultural workplaces and possibly even further to those employing uh, international agricultural workers. If the training were to be accepted by employers and workplace management, it could build awareness among farmers of well, workplace factors, policies, and practices that may be causing psychological harm to international agriculture workers and other workers employed, possibly leading to changes and improvements in this area. Another promising practice that we found is mental health services and initiatives specializing in work with migrant communities. This initiative that we found, um, they offer mental health assessment and support to international agricultural workers, and they are culturally appropriate and they incorporate an understanding of the unique challenges faced by all international agricultural workers communities. Such support must also, must also recognize and address issues of stigma while at the same time draw on cultural strengths and forms of support that are familiar and important to international agricultural workers. Also, they should center of empowerment and awareness of these workers. The initiatives that we see on the screen, Project Escucho, Ayuda Emocional en Tiempos de COVID by Fundación Origen, and Watari Migrant to Migrant uh, uh, Program, they're phone-based, uh, they have flexible hours, they are, are culturally knowledgeable, language specific. They ex have experience, under, experience understanding the social determinants of health of migrant communities and work from an empowerment framework. More uh, detailed information about all of these um, initiatives and services can be found in the report. Thank you. I wanted to speak about um, a couple of research teams and community of practices. Um, 
So first, um, the migrant worker health expert um, working group is an interdisciplinary team of scholars and clinicians focusing on providing evidence-based recommendations to all levels of government. So um, the reason, uh, the, the objective of this group is to establish adequate standards, regulations, and practices and um, to ensure that the health and, uh, and the, the purpose is to ensure the health and safety of migrant workers within the context um, of COVID-19 pandemic is protected as well as other contexts. Uh, so the group recognizes that the social determinants of health um, among migrant agriculture workers in Canada um, are related to their working and living settings and to their degree of access to health care and social supports. So the group started in April of 2020 and produced a series of recommendations and guidelines. Um, and these include, but are not limited to recommendations aimed at housing, health, improving the vaccination process and improving oversight of employer provided housing. Um, so the group also operates a website um, and the link is um, in the report and it provides pages in English and Spanish that contain information and resources, including information on COVID-19 federal and provincial guidance and travel requirements, income replacements, how to access um, emergency medical care, workers' compensation, um, occupational health and safety um, rights, and uh, a lot more. So the second uh, group is the Mental Health of Migrant Agriculture Workers Research Group, and this is um, a new emerging group. So uh, basically it was initiated with the objective of designing a research proposal for a study into the mental health of migrant agriculture workers in multiple Canadian provinces. So this project will be informed by a pilot study, uh, which is currently being conducted and will um, document the experiences of migrant agriculture workers as they relate to their holistic well-being. Um, including the effects of COVID-19 on mental health, uh, the psychosocial impacts of employment, work conditions, discrimination, migration regulations, as well as experiences or, um, of, or barriers to support services. So in addition uh, to working on the pilot study, the group conducts regular facilitated, facilitated meetings to discuss key issues and um, the state of current academic research um, with regards to mental health of migrant agriculture workers, uh, including things like access to services, workplace environment, family separation, and interpers interpersonal relationships, as well as housing conditions. Um, so this group has initiated a community of practice around the mental health of migrant agriculture workers in both Ontario and Quebec and um, have created a space to discuss, uh, consider and plan future research in this area. Um, so a couple of community of practices that are already out there um, uh, are the University of Guelph in the NO team. So this team involves farmers, psychotherapists, psychologists, counselors, and a professional in adult education. Um, and the group developed a mental health literacy program based on the needs and experiences of farmers. So the resulting program is called In the Know and is a four hour in-person program de delivered by mental health profession a mental health professional and who also had experience in agriculture. So the pilot training was evaluated through a pre-training questionnaire and a post-training questionnaire at the end of the session, and again at three and six months. So results from the evaluation of the program showed that the participants improved in self-reported mental health and in their knowledge and confidence to recognize mental health struggles, as well as um, to discuss these issues with others. So following the pilot research, um, the research team partnered with CMHA to continue to deliver the training. So currently CMHA um, has 35 facilitator, facilitators delivering the in the know program in rural, rural areas. Um, so find, 
last but not least, uh, so PAMH, um, Immigrant and Refugee Mental Health Project, focuses on building capacity among settlement, social, or health service provider, and to respond to the unique mental health needs of immigrants and refugees, and to also foster intersector and interprofessional collaboration. So the, pro the project is directed by evidence-based information, innovative practices, as well as tools and strat strategies, including subject matter experts, courses, community of practice, webinars, and e-newsletter, -news discussion boards, feedback, and a toolkit. So um, another example of uh, KMH development of key resources in the field of immigrant mental health is its ebook on the mental health of immigrants who are alone in Canada. So the book titled Alone in Canada provides information for new immigrants on how to integrate themselves in the Canadian community. So although this program does not focus on the experiences of a migrant agriculture workers in particular, it's identified as a promising practice and it's an example of awareness building around the mental health needs of migrant populations. Um, and uh, a focus on building research-based effective services and support capacity among, among providers working with these groups. I also wanted to highlight uh, two Ontario Health and Safety Associations that um, have work and experience uh, that we think is, is uh, uh, conducive to, to this area. So one being the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers um, and the other being the Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, WSPS. Uh, so both of these HSAs have relevant experience, resources, and tools to support occupational health and safety in agricultural workplaces, including um, those that hire or, or occupational health and safety among international agricultural workers. Both also have experience in the area of workplace mental health and psychosocial factors. So in the report, we get into a lot more of, of this and, and the resources and tools that they've developed, but Oak House assessment and recommendation tools have supported workers and workplaces to identify psychosocial hazards and consider changes to prevent harm at the workplace level. And WSPS, as the lead for health and safety in agriculture, has extensive experiencing, experience working with farmers and other agricultural industry stakeholders and safety experts and has developed a lot of safety resources and programming for the industry. So we recognize that both the work of OCO and SPS um, are important contributions and collaboration between these HSAs in the area of workplace health and safety, as well as workplace mental health and psychosocial factors um, should be explored and supported. Um, in our promising practices, we also identified some coming from the US. So this is really out of recognition of the years of experience of migrant agricultural workers um, in the US, um, as well as the years of experience of service provision to these communities and, and support provision to these communities. Um, we do recognize that, of course, there's there's differences in the experience, uh, experiences of migrant or seasonal agricultural workers in the US and Canada. Um, however, we do identify a lot of similarities and there's a lot of amazing great work coming out of the US that, that we identified as, as very useful for, for Canadian stakeholders to review and to inform uh, planning and, and rollout of programs and, and supports. So in, in the report, we go into a lot more detail, but we, we do identify the Migrant Clinicians Network as well as the National Center for Farm Worker Health. So both of these organizations are focused on capacity building among community health centers, as well as migrant health centers in the US, um, building their capacity to provide services, effective services to uh, migrant and, and seasonal agricultural workers. Um, so they, they provide training, orientation, they develop resources on various uh, primary, as well as occupational health topics affecting these communities. Um, and they've definitely built communities of practice to share best practices across the US. Um, the National Center for Farm Worker Health has a resource mental health hub that has a lot of resources and really was developed through this learning collaborative, this mental health learning collaborative that they put together that again is sharing best practices from various um, health and mental health service providers across the US. Uh, 
every year, the National Center for Farm, for Farm Worker Health puts on three U.S. migrant worker health forums, um, and we've had the the um, opportunity to to attend these forums virtually and in person pre COVID. Um, and usually in these forums, there's always a stream focused on mental health of of um, international or, or migrant seasonal agricultural workers. Another best practices uh, that we identified was coming out of the University of Oregon, the Pacific University out of Oregon, and is their Sabidura program. Uh, so this was a, uh, this is a very interesting program that comes out of their psychology department that provides opportunities for psychology graduate students uh, to specialize in Latinx psychology services. Um, so it provides students with both uh, research as well as applied skills um, in understanding and and providing treatment to Latinx communities. So during the COVID um, pandemic, this program actually leveraged students and staff providing direct um, services to migrant workers experiencing uh, trauma and health uh, and mental health um, uh, issues related to both forest fires um, that were occurring in the region as well as the COVID pandemic themselves. So this initiative also deployed a, a rapid response treatment, a mental health treatment skills, um, and is really interesting in the sense of, you know, a, a project or, or an initiative that really works. Um, to try to uh, provide direct services in crisis situations. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we include a bit more information on them in the report. The National Agricultural Worker Survey is also something that we identified as a best practice in the US. So this is a, uh, an employment-based random sample survey of US crop workers that collects demographic employment and health data in face-to-face -face, uh, interviews. So it uses, uses methodology designed to address difficulties of uh, surveying mobile and seasonal populations, often living in non-standard and, and sometimes hitting housing, similar to experiences in Ontario. So approximately 71,000 crop workers have been interviewed as part of the NAS, and it's recognized as the only national information source on employment, demographic, and health characteristics of hired crop workers. So it's data is considered central uh, to, to informing government programs and services and, and um, in, uh, addressing information gaps across a variety of, of additional stakeholders. Um, so now we'll move on to our gaps and recommendations section. Um, so I'll get us started just on, on the first one. Um, and so, you know, a clear gap that we identified was long-term funding for IAW support networks. And as my colleagues have noted, there's, you know, amazing work going on in terms of community groups and support organizations um, that are already, you know, critically supporting IAWs in Ontario. However, many of these uh, organizations and groups noted that their support capacity and reach are restricted due to limited or precarious funding. Um, and this included uh, feedback from organizations that were funded by Kairos, the, the federal government funding, noting that um, this had been difficult in terms of continuing their efforts due to that funding not being long term. So the recommendation is that the provincial government should develop a funding partnership with the federal government to secure permanent or at least long term funding dedicated to continuing to strengthen support networks who are on the ground and responding to the needs of IAWs. This funding should prioritize programming with a clear focus on empowerment outcomes for IAWs and support their capacity and agency. And so one of the recommendations we have for this long-term funding that Eduardo described um, would be to provide a, a portion of it or allocate a portion of this long-term funding to strengthening and expanding legal services provided to migrant farm workers by Ontario legal clinics and that's not just um, direct service provision, but also legal education um, efforts, which are really important to inform workers of their legal rights and also direct them um, to the mechanisms and processes uh, and the assistance that they can help uh, access to have help through those processes. Um, because legal clinics are such a crucial resource uh, to helping workers make legal claims when um, their rights have been violated or if they're injured or become sick. So given workers' pervasive fear of injury, the dangerous and physically demanding nature of their work, and their structural disempowerment, this funding should be allocated to legal, legal services focused on WSIB-related issues in particular, as well as other employment and workplace health and safety issues to address the barriers that farm workers face in accessing legal services and workers' compensation when they're injured or ill. So we also have recommendations um, aimed at Ontario Health Centre funding. Um, we feel strongly that funding should go to Ontario Health to strengthen and expand healthcare services for migrant agricultural workers in Ontario 
and to conduct additional needs assessments regarding access gaps and barriers to ensure that workers have access to adequate health services in all regions where they are working and living. Funding should also be allocated, allocated to collaboration with occupational health and safety system partners to ensure that work-related health issues identified by primary health clinics can lead to opportunities to explore workplace interventions that are focused on prevention. This funding should also develop primary clinic leads on occupational health and safety and workers' compensation in partnership with legal clinics. Funding should be allocated to conducting a service strategy assessment and develop a framework to address the practical service delivery challenges experienced by clinics serving migrant workers, including issues of reaching the workers, communication, transportation, and follow-up, while ensuring that the privacy and independence of workers in healthcare access and treatment is the highest priority and aligns with legislation on health information privacy. It's also um, important to consider the inaccessibility of the WSIB system for most workers. The current process for a worker to file a work-related injury or illness claim is not accessible or appropriate to migrant farm workers. Injured workers generally lack an understanding of the WSIB and its purposes and processes, and they definitely need assistance navigating the system and filing a claim. Workers face unique challenges accessing workers' compensation because they can be fired and deported before their health issues are investigated and resolved. Many workers are afraid to file claims for fear of being sent home and or loss of future employment. Addressing the barriers farm workers experiencing, experience in filing a claim and accessing WSIB entitlements is needed to provide them with accessible and effective workplace injury and illness services and supports. All right, so I will now hand it over to my colleague, Cynthia, who will detail a few more of our recommendations. Thank you, Stephanie. So another gap that we found it that is related to funding, we consider that the Ontario government should support CMHA in Ontario in developing a provincial strategy for mental health support and services for international agricultural worker communities, working from its position as a key stakeholder in mental health in the agricultural sector. This funding should explore opportunities to build on current services being offered to farmers and their communities. Although international agricultural workers do face different stressors and mental health risk factors than farmers, and it will be crucial to conceptualize information, contextualize, sorry, information and services to address the needs of international agriculture workers, existing services could be adopted. In addition, this work should draw on the experience of particular CMHA branches like CMHA Windsor Essex to identify best practices, services, and resources already developed for international agriculture workers, collaborate with Black health and mental health organizations like Taibu Community Health Center, Collaborate with research teams and community uh, of practice stakeholders focusing on mental health and mental health of these workers. We also consider that they should collaborate with key mental health initiatives specializing working with migrant communities, like those highlighted in these projects as well as others. Explore collaboration with CAMH uh, immigrant and refugee mental health project. Another gap that we found is that direct mental health support for Ontario international agricultural workers. Um, so this, uh, the initiatives that we uh, talked about before, uh, we think that the Ontario government with guidance of CMHA should support existing phone-based counseling services for international agricultural workers with experience serving migrant and racialized communities support the creation of additional services for with Afro-Caribbean community representation and service focus, explore collaboration with Black um, health and mental health organizations like Taibu. And these services should not only be marketed for emergency situations, but from a mental health protective prevention-based perspective. Central to these services is the provision of support in workers' languages by staff that ideally shares the same or a similar cultural background as workers they will be serving. 
A staff working with this population should receive training that acknowledges cultural differences and the social and economic backgrounds of workers, create awareness of situations and difficulties these workers face in Canada, and have a strong knowledge of the risk factors faced by this population. These actions will facilitate mental health professionals' understanding and the detection of red flags. Okay, so we also um, noted gaps and have recommendations related to crisis and urgent care services for workers in Ontario. Um, so the accessibility and appropriateness of current crisis and mental health urgent care hotlines for use by migrant farm workers is not clear. The Ontario government with guidance from CMHA, we feel and recommend should evaluate the accessibility and appropriateness of the existing urgent care and mental health crisis hotlines for use by worker communities and if they are deemed not effective, create emergency hotlines of this type that would be accessible to worker populations. Um, we also uh, recommend that CMHA identify or create accessible and appropriate bereavement support resources and services for migrant workers, specifically in the context of situations where family members and loved ones pass away while they are here in Canada. Um, Interview findings um, revealed to us that many workers suffer mental health distress in association with the loss of loved ones um, that is compounded by the fact that they don't have support through the bereavement process and they're also quite isolated from their loved ones. Um, and we can also think about that in the context of when a coworker is um, hurt or killed on the job. Um, many times coworkers are aware of that or in, in some cases or many cases witness these kinds of accidents. Um, and so we think it's important to create accessible and appropriate services for workers in cases where a coworker dies or experiences a serious injury or illness in order to address the trauma that bystander workers may experience. And we also um, recommend that CMHA should consider WSIB's role in supporting the services um, in cases of workplace deaths or serious injuries or illnesses. Um, there is no real follow through in the case of um, a worker's death to determine whether family members have accessed the WSIB entitlements that they are entitled to, um, or whether they have information on how to do so and the support that they may require. We also noted some gaps and have some recommendations um, on services and supports focused um, for Black Caribbean workers. And so programming and staffing considerations across all relevant service areas present opportunities to build on current work and to improve outcomes for Black Caribbean agricultural workers in Ontario. As a part of the long-term funding for migrant worker support networks and stakeholders, a subsection of this funding should prioritize the expansion and development of support initiatives and organizations that are specifically focused on doing work with Black um, international agricultural workers. Health services serving international workers can be conceptualized as dedicated services for racialized communities, including black worker communities. And as such, these clinics should be supported with information and resources specific to racialized patients, including black patients. A subsection of the funding should go to organizations like Taibu Community Health Center, the Black Health Alliance, and the Black Physicians Association of Ontario, as well as the Black Scientists Task Force on Vaccine Equity, to lead an assessment of healthcare access and delivery for Black workers, with a focus on identifying opportunities to build on existing services and contribute to improved outcomes for Black worker populations. This could include a strategy to respond to future possible vaccine information requests from workers. So another gap that we identified was the, con the continued concern with I IAW housing, um, including unsafe and, and um, un undignified uh, conditions that put workers at risk and also are not conducive to general well-being and mental health. Um, as noted in a recent Auditor General of Canada report, the federal government has done little to meet its commitments to improve housing conditions for IAWs. So we provide a recommendation to improve IAW housing standards and conditions and ensure enforcement is effective and consider housing standards of other mobile workers in Canada, such as, for example, the oil sand worker accommodations in Alberta, and contextualize this to working in agriculture and to the experiencing experiences and needs of IAWs and also to review and incorporate housing standard submissions made directly by IWs through some of the advocacy groups who, who themselves speak to housing that would, be, that would support their health and well-being. 
And with this is the recognition that proper housing is central for physical and mental rest and recovery amidst extremely you know, difficult work in agriculture, as well as uh, exposure to other stressors that, that we've identified and that have been identified in the literature. So another gap has been lack of accessible information to, for IAWs. So government agencies continue to neglect the accessibility needs of IAWs when it comes to key information on policies, practices, rights, and responsibilities. And key communication and reporting channels and policy processes continue to not be accessible to many IAWs. Government continues to be slow or has failed to respond with effective solutions. So recommendation is that the government, the provincial government should develop a clear accessibility framework when it comes to policy and practice, communication, planning, process, rollout, and consultation related to and with IAWs. This framework should be implemented by all relevant ministries to ensure a commitment to empowering IAWs to be informed and be able to, to respond effectively to government legislation, benefits, protections, and requirements. Without this commitment, the government continues to show a disregard for how its policies actually play out for these communities. So another gap has been the available data on IEWs in Ontario. So we recognize that there's no statistical data available on IEWs, nor research, including representative samples. So recommendation is that demographic information and other general IEW existing data should be publicly available. Information such as sex, uh, such as age, sex, country of origin, language spoken, uh, educational attainment, years or numbers of, of, of employment um, and provincial or and, and which uh, province or region workers are arriving to should uh, would support informed decision making across all levels. Um, an IEW national or provincial survey focused on work, health and mental health, for example, similar to the US NAS would benefit, would, would be beneficial. Systematic and periodic information collection is needed to support policies at all levels and offer a base for comparison for the various indicators, for example, between work and health. Data collection initiatives by community support groups would also be useful to, to improve understanding of service provision and support. The sharing of this data would be beneficial as long as again, it's anonymous without worker identifying information. Um, another gap has been mental health pr protection and promotion in the workplace. So according to project findings, little information has been produced in Canada about psychosocial environment, about the psychosocial environment and occupational hazards at work influencing the mental health of workers on Ontario farms. As we noted, research and practice has focused on farmers' mental health. However, many risk factors differ among uh, four, four IAWs. There are many published studies that document various facets of the social determinants of health among this worker population, but only a few of them have focused on the injuries and hazards at work, fewer on mental health hazards in the workplace, and none based on hazard assessment in the workplace. So we recommend applied research um, should be promoted uh, and supported to seek to understand and act on the factors affecting the mental health of this population. This includes assessing mental health hazards in the workplace and work towards their management, elimination and control, and evaluating their mental health impacts. So connected to, a little bit connected to this, and eliminating control exposure to, to workplace health and safety hazards. As uh, my colleagues had mentioned, uh, issues related to health and safety were identified as a significant stressor among IWs in our, in our study, along with the perception of feeling unsafe and the worry of becoming ill or disabled. So more preventative action needs to be conducted at the workplace level, including increased training and active enforcement. OHS regulation must be enforced and expanded to ensure safe working environments for IAWs. Interventions in agricultural workplaces to reduce risk and physical injuries or mental health disorders have been implemented and evaluated in other countries, including the US as well as in Europe, as evidenced in the literature review of this project. So we have examples um, that, we can, that we can base our, our own efforts on. Validated tools should be adapted to identify psychosocial hazards in the workplace affecting the mental health of IAWs so that interventions for eliminating or controlling them can be developed. These tools should consider hazardous hazards broadly associated with agricultural with agricultural work, as well as specific hazards faced by IWs, and they should be culturally informed and employ accessible language. Research that directly involves IWs and leads to concrete actions and changes to work conditions should be prioritized. Participatory research used in agricultural settings could lead to possible uh, to positive changes if the proper conditions and dialogue dialogues with stakeholders uh, are in place. Connected um, to the elimination and control of exposures to workplace health and safety hazards, um, we identify changes needed to directly improve or address OHS concerns that lead to chronic stress and mental health issues among IWs. These include opening of work permits so that IWs are not tied to a single employer, ensure OHS legislation effectively 
regulates occupational hazards in agriculture, including establishing exposure limits and and that um, and that legislation is proactively enforced. Surveillance programs on the impacts of key hazards should be mandated and implemented. OHS policies and procedures should be ensured to function effectively for IAWs, including the internal responsibility system, um, and evaluate um, and then, uh, sorry, a recommendation to evaluate and improve the anti reprisal procedures and protections of IAWs is also extremely important uh, to address, again, the concern of, of reprisals when speaking out about OHS concerns or reporting injuries or illness. A gap identified uh, broadly is the continued structural disempowerment of IAWs. So, recognizing that IAWs in Ontario continue to face structural disempowerment that negatively impacts their primary mental, public, and occupational health outcomes, the province should develop an empowerment strategy and framework for this workforce that is multifaceted and identifies clear areas for out for empowerment outcomes. The strategy should be informed by findings from IAWs themselves, advocacy, support, and service stakeholders, and should include results and improvements in the following areas. Information access, Ability to access services and supports, including health and social services. Ability to identify and report concerns without fear of facing reprisals. Ability to make legal claims and access justice when rights are violated. As part of the strategy, the province should respond to evidence that the restricted immigration status of IWs continues to negatively impact their health and well-being, including in areas of primary, mental, public, and occupational health and safety, specifically creating precarity and fear of reprisals or an inability to work in Canada if they raise or report issues or, or access services and, and supports, including WSIB compensation. As part of this disempowerment um, framework and, and priority, uh, the province should develop and implement a poverty reduction strategy for the Ontario agricultural sector labour force. The province should conduct a review of agricultural sector employment in the province, including a specific focus on IAWs from a poverty reduction framework and develop a poverty reduction strategy for the industry and its labour force. It is crucial to address poverty as a social determinant of health and key factor related to labour gaps in the industry, as well as risk factors as well as a risk factor for negative outcomes to primary, mental, public, and occupational health among all workers and particularly IEWs. Um, lastly, the recommendation, uh, we recommend the development of an anti-racism and anti-black racism framework through which to assess and inform current and future policies, practices, and services related to Ontario IEWs. So this should be connected to provincial anti-racism, anti-black racism commitments and strategies to improve outcomes for racialized and black communities in Ontario and draw on provincial resources and leaderships, uh, leadership in this area. So that concludes um, our presentation and, and now we'd be very interested to, to answer any questions and, and uh, have some discussions with all of you. Great, thanks a lot, Eduardo. I am just going to, there's been one question in the chat thus far, but other people can put them in the chat or put up their hand uh, if they have a question. Um, the first question uh, and the speakers who might answer the question could turn on their video, including anybody who wants to speak. But um, the first question was around the identification of the gap that you discovered in terms of primary care providers, how or what steps are taking place to close those gaps? I don't know if we touched on that or if you wanted to add uh, anything else. Sure. So, yeah, the, the interviews with, with um, community health centres from Ontario were extremely interesting and, and provided a lot of insight in terms of the work that the, the community health centres are doing, um, the different uh, uh, methods or, or service provision, um, uh, what would be the word? Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the structure of their service provision. And, um, but some of them, so in the report, we really get into that. Some of them do talk about feeling as though they're not reaching all workers in, in their region. Um, you know, even among some of the regions with the most longstanding uh, primary health care services for agricultural workers, including Niagara, for example, um, you know, the local uh, community health center noted that they continue to still run into workers who have no idea about their services. And they note that they promote their services widely to employers to, you know, so it definitely starts, uh, you know, painting a picture that even in the most active and pro or the most proactive uh, and experienced uh, uh, catchment areas or of community health centers and catchment areas, there's still workers who who might not be uh, connecting to, to services. So, um, 
we, we were aware of funding requests um, and interest for additional funding to expand services among community health centers that they that a couple of community health centers said that they were awaiting or that th this this funding hadn't been approved or delivered to them. Um, and in the report, there's various statements from community health centers talking about what they would do with more funding, what they think more funding would be useful for. Whereas other ones, though, said that they they thought that funding was the required funding for their work was there and it was not about funding. So um, in, in the interviews, you, you kind of see both sides, but, uh, but in our scan though, it, it definitely was uh, a clear finding that in some regions, it was very difficult to identify points of access to primary healthcare services among workers. Um, and we, and that's why we leveraged uh, telehealth across the posters, because it was our attempt to say, you know, within the scope of this project, we probably need to go deeper to really connect to where people are going. And, and I know that employers often connect workers to health services. So we might have missed, uh, you know, strategies that are being employed uh, by employers. But again, then it circles back to the idea of independent access by workers, right? And that and that was also a concern that was um, that was raised. Um, so I'm not sure if I, I, I don't think I answered the perfectly, but I think that community health centers are trying to ask for more funding and, and it seems like it's, uh, in you know being considered but hasn't arrived yet and but then their positions around if more funding is required is is a bit mixed in our findings um i, I do want to just quickly mention the and, and we raised it in terms of that independent access among services and this is something that's really that i think our findings really scratched at is that from a practicality standpoint there's a lot more community health centers deploying um services to work sites or or very much like workplace uh participating services right so there was a couple of community health centers that uh are are directly providing clinics to greenhouses or and physically in their space right or, or other ones that arrive and either a mobile unit uh, to that space and they really talk about how that's the participation of employers or workplace management is integral and like stephanie and uh, mentioned in her slide for communicating to workers follow up with workers um a lot of them noted that they can't get a hold of workers who don't have cell phones so that they they go through management to do so and and of course they noted you know a priority on on um the um on uh, uh the privacy of workers right and and they they don't go beyond sharing information that that would would jeopardize that but it definitely seemed to be an area that requires attention around like we said in our recommendation around assessing how services um can be effective uh understanding the experience of community health centers, how they can be supported to to um, effectively provide their services, but while really leveraging this this commitment to independent access. Um, but in a practical sense, it just sounds like it's it's very difficult. Thanks. Uh, Michelle had her hand up and then disappeared. Oh, you're still there. Michelle, did you want to? Yeah, no, I am still here. Uh, Eduardo covered the vast majority of that picture. Uh, and um, I, I think that the, the thing about funding is that um, the, the CHCs um, through their umbrella organization, um, uh, uh, Alliance for Healthier Communities has been um, uh, in discussions with Ontario Health uh, for a long, long time. I would say probably more than a year and the, the funding um, uh, has been um, discussed, uh, but what continue to hear from Ontario Health is that they do not have um, uh, access to, to funds to expand services. And, but this has just been going on and on and on the discussion because the CHCs were asked to submit proposals, which were marvelous. And as Eduardo said, uh, the services on, uh, at the workplace have promised, um, uh, for many reasons for accessibility, but also um, to engage in occupational health and safety interventions um, with the cooperation with uh, employers and hopefully uh -huh, joint health and safety committees. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I think at the one of the meetings, um, I, I suggested that when employers come and ask the CHCs saying they need more services for their workers, get them to contact their MPs um, because that's where the money needs to come from. 
anyway, but there's some tremendous work that's being done. Um, really, really, really good um, examples of best practices. So really grateful to the initiatives of, of so many of these people. Thanks. Uh, does anybody else have a question that they want to unmute and ask or? or... Yeah, I, I had my hand up. Um, oh, I missed it. I, great. It's okay. Um, just... Hello, everyone. And thank you for this really interesting and, and such important work to have an overview like this. And I agree with Michelle. There's, there's no shortage of good and creative and, and brilliant ideas at a community level. Um, I noticed with the promising um, um, initiatives that you identified, um, most, if not all, were um, were sort of uh, at an individual community level. And Michelle just talked about how, how difficult it is for the CHCs um, to to sort of have initiatives. Um, by themselves, but I would imagine across the board as well. And and if you could comment on on that. And then my second part is you you identified the gaps, and it seemed to be that WSIB was was just particularly a a no go zone, a no fly zone in terms of um, the services being provided to the workers. And I wondered if you could comment on that as well. Thank you. I don't know if I might like to take that. You're going to start, Steph? I'd, I'd be happy to take the WSIB question if you want to take the first question. Thank you, Sure. Sorry to clarify, the first one was, I, I think I. It, it was it was about the no shortage of really, you know, really great creative yes. ideas at a community level, but then the, the difficulty of, uh, as the CHCs have experienced individually, and I would guess collectively in, um, so getting sustained and, and secured funding. Yes, definitely. And I think our project that was the most, you know, such an amazing part of it is is speaking to so many stakeholders, including the community groups and, and healthcare organizations, as well as CMHA Windsor Essex, just amazing work being done and and just so many best practices, but it does definitely seem that um, they speak about, you know, restrictions on reach, on on ability, staff, staff, you know, staffing restrictions. Um, in the report, there's really interesting stuff. So even some community health centers note that ideally they would have, I think one mentioned triple the staff that they currently have if they were really trying to to have an impact. Um, so it definitely um, seems seems like a, a challenge. And in terms of the community groups, this Kairos funding really has changed the game in terms of mm -hmm. formalizing a lot of work that has been done being done by community groups for years. Suddenly they had a budget and suddenly they were not all working on volunteerism um, like they mm -hmm. have for so many years, right? Uh, but even then we heard from community groups that even retaining staff, so they would identify amazing staff that has experience in their region from years of working volunteer based now are paid staff um, and, you know, having great, great uh, people, but then because of the um, precariousness of the funding or, or not commitment to long term funding, losing that staff um, and, and because that staff is waiting to hear if, if funding is going to be renewed um, and have to go out and make their livelihoods and, and go look for other work in case it's not renewed. And so that's kind of been um, and it's been a struggle because you think, you know, these initiatives are filling in such important gaps and they're all reporting to provincial or federal uh, government, right? So it does feel like at some point, you know, it, there needs to be commitment to recognize that these services are fundamental and they're not, you know, they're, they're really helping a lot, but there's obviously structural changes like we mentioned that need to take place, but at least at this very practical level. Um, so yeah, there was one example too that was a big one was um, when COVID-19 kind of requirements came on and for example, switch health or, or arrival requirements for workers to have to via an app log in and, and uh, you know, uh, report sim changing symptoms and stuff, how that system was not prepared for, for this workforce and it came as a requirement and how community groups were not only actively helping workers sign in, getting passwords from family members that set up things up in home countries mm -hmm. for workers, mm -hmm. but also developed videos. So the first, um, you know, instructional video on how to even use that was developed by a community group. It wasn't developed by government and that uh, video went viral because 
it was needed, right? Um, and then, you know, government caught up, but it's, so these are kind of fundamental efforts that are coming from the community level. And again, the precariousness or the, or the lack of commitment to, to make sure, and imagine well-funded and, and resourced what more could happen, right? In changing the, the support zone. So, oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and when you think about just all the hours spent reinventing the wheel, because as you said, people have Catherine, you seem to have moved away from your mic. We didn't hear the last phrase. Oh, sorry, just um, um, just about reinventing the wheel all the time mm -hmm. when uh, funding is precarious and has to stop and start and stop and start. Um, and yes, just think of what we could do if if that was different. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eduardo. And just to follow up, Catherine, on your question about WSIB, so as it relates to mental health in particular, um, so, you know, workers arrive healthy, they, they have to pass medical exams in their home countries, but their physical and mental health deteriorate as they're working here. Um, and that's because of the demanding nature of their work. Um, and so, as agricultural employees, they're subject to the same hazards and occupational health and safety risks that any worker would be, but those risks are compounded um, by their precarious status and by the common practice of medical repatriation, which is when uh, employers who are empowered to fire and deport workers without explanation in order to attain a replacement, um, and notably workers when they're coming up to Canada for the year are tied to that one employer. And so even in cases of injury and illness, Workers are very hesitant uh, to report that to their employers in order to access care and compensation for a few reasons. One, they do not want to be seen as an undesirable employee that may jeopardize their current and future employment in Canada. Um, they also worry that they'll be immediately sent home before they receive care and compensation. And we know many workers work through injury and illness for these fears. Um, but in the cases where a worker does wish to file a claim with WSIV, um, we find that workers are extremely confused about the process. It's, it's not straightforward that workers' compensation in Ontario is run by a third-party insurer and that that insurer's um, funds are sourced through employers whose premiums go up when workers file claims. And so for those reasons, employers may not be forthright in providing the right kinds of workers' compensation supports and information. But it's also essential that workers have independent access to this kind of information so that they can access claims and benefits they're entitled to independent of their employer's gaze. But many workers report that even when they do file a claim, their interactions with the WSIB case managers are frustrating, confusing, demeaning, dehumanizing, um, and oftentimes that's exacerbated by similar treatment in their work environments. And many workers are sent home long before they've accessed the health care and compensation they need to make a full recovery and return to work. Um, many workers, almost all workers, do not return to work. Thanks, Stephanie. It sounds like not much has changed. Sadly. Sadly. <laughs> yes. I see Michelle has her hand up. Maybe she wants to add something to what I was saying. Yeah. Well, just you've already mentioned it in your slide, Steph, but just to reinforce um, the uh, issue that uh, work-related conditions are not well recognized by um, clinicians. And uh, as you say, um, to file uh, a WSAB claim um, is a big deal. It's 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 actually a big deal for most workers, but for this population, um, it it is insurmountable um, in many cases. And that was one of the big um, uh, issues that we saw when we were doing um, clinics with workers in terms of um, uh, really gaining trust of workers is to really have to promise them that this was their information and we would do with it what they wanted us to do. And it was really hard for an occupational health organization to not file WSIB claims, but the risk of the workers being repatriated, losing their jobs and their income to support their family was really too great for many of them. Thanks, Michelle. I see Lisbeth has a question. Would you like to unmute and turn on your video to ask it, Lisbeth? Hi, um, my camera doesn't work, so I'm unable to do that, but I did have a question in regards to um, 
how we can move towards long-term funding. Um, so I, I don't know, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Lizbeth. I am a mental health support worker at the Migrant Worker Community Program. Um, I speak Spanish and English. So I provide uh, mental health support uh, for this community in both languages. Um, right now, we are currently kind of in the middle of um, trying to find long-term, like permanent funding for these services because we see this as an essential uh, resource for this community. And so I was just wondering what your input was and like what our program could do to um, kind of get the right people listening. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I think um, in our in our recommendations, we really try to show the importance of leading mental health organizations like CMHA, um, specifically CMHA, and the work that they're doing at the provincial level and the experience that they've garnered around mental health of farmers and stressors within the industry, and recognizing that they themselves are identifying that this this um, that migrant workers are or international culture, agriculture workers are a group that they haven't yet. Um, engaged with, um, but are interested other than, but I, I say that, but the CMHA Windsor-Essex uh, uh, branch has been very active. Um, and I know in collaboration with, uh, with the Migrant Worker Community Program as well. Um, so in our recommendations, we really try to uh, provide, and again, our recommendations are going to OMAFRA and, and to the province, um, but we really try to identify that similarly, how funding has been directed and rightly so to farmer mental health uh, through a lot of the red flags that the University of Guelph research team um, raised through their, their important research and, and they're in the no program, the same way that that kind of has led with um, to funding um, allocated provincial federal partnership funding to then services for um, employers, for farmers and their communities, we, we suggest that the same should be done uh, uh, in terms of mirroring the, the needs of workers, right? And so we would see that, you know, an organization like CMHA may be taking a role, but definitely collaborating with, with uh, initiatives like yourself, right? Who are on the ground, who have that cultural and that knowledge capacity. And it has to be that kind of um, collaboration and funding flowing through, you know, uh, to that, to, 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 to you <laughs> and to effective resources. Because in the literature we see, you know, that, uh, this type of support has to be culturally contextualized. It has to be um, in the language of workers, obviously. So um, I think that's where initiatives like yours really will inform the work of, of mental health organizations that are yet to necessarily understand the, the needs and, and situations of these communities. But, um, but we should definitely uh, connect and, and we're hoping that following this report that we'll see some action or, and we'll continue, um, you know, trying to push those levers. Um, and I think more research, the, the, the reality, and sorry, I'm, I'm ranting a bit, but the reality is, you know, the study that came out on farmers was a national study that, that was really, you know, it was a research study. Our project is not a research study. We did do some interviews, um, but it really, you know, merits, you know, a, a, a strong provincial and, and eventually national study on, on mental health and psychosocial needs of this population in, in a variety of, of workplace and, and other settings. Um, even though we don't think we need, evidence is always good, but I think, yeah, that's required and hopefully then that would uh, result in, in really direct funding, but it's definitely a need. Thanks. Uh, I see, Iswani, you have a question, but I also actually wanted to, we should, I think at least, um, thank OMAFRA for funding this project because it, it was pretty, um, it was exciting. It was a lot of work um, for the team uh, and assembled a lot of information that was difficult to distill in a way that, that a, pro a progressive way, uh, which I think you guys have done in the report as well as in the presentation, but um, uh, OMAFRA actually came to us, right? So they, they're, so uh, we haven't asked them, they're not uh, speaking today about what they might do with the report um, because I'm sure there's um, complexities around it, but I think that is a leadership even to recognize the need and to fund um, at least this uh, scoping review or whatever you might want to call it. So I didn't want to forget to mention that, that um, um, that, that is an important, I think, as, as to move the dialogue along. Uh, Swani, did you have a question? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be uh, in here. And yes, all the information has been great. Uh, uh, like uh, Valerie said, uh, there was there, this was a lot of work, 
but it also provides a lot of great information for, for people, organizations that we try to support workers. Um, and it gives us a better understanding of um, the general areas that they need support because um, they need support in many areas. And in my, 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 my comment probably is not more a question, it's more like a comment or, or uh, a wondering. Like, for example, when we talk about mental health support, um, having in some of the um, uh, proposals or like ideas, uh, telling um, CAMH or these organizations or clinics with health, mental health, that maybe uh, programs as may, um, including more like community programs and things like that. I don't know how they want to deliver the, the programs, but sometimes um, I think programs have to be delivered like thinking in account the cultural background, also how they work, like the accessibility, because if um, it's gonna just be somebody speaking on the phone with them, will that work? Like I think that uh, mental health for uh, culturally, especially I'm talking for Latinx community, we need that kind of closeness to community, like music, all those things, and those part and those are part of like mental health. So um, I, I'm wondering if these programs are like kind of like included, or these um, options or the ideas are included, or are going to be included in, in in the in the ideas that they have. I, I don't know. That's a really good point. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And, and just to mention, Aswani is part of our team, uh, our, research, our, our project team, and, and she helps conduct a lot of the interviews with the Latinx uh, community uh, workers. And um, but yeah, I think it's it's definitely very important. And and that can, came out in the in the literature review as well as in our scans around the importance of having yeah services be culturally appropriate and and really understanding. Um, that's why a lot of the looking into the US was very useful for us too. So just initiatives out of the US in, in terms of service provision for Latinx, particularly showcasing Latin uh, work with Latinx uh, agriculture workers, is just so developed in the US is what we found. Um, there's a lot of capacity building, there's a lot of recognition. Um, a lot of the service providers themselves are Latinx community members, right? And I think that's something interesting that needs to be explored in some of these uh, these areas is is realistically service provision in a lot of rural towns um, you know might not reflect or might not be able to pull staff from the culture communities of um, agriculture workers I think that's changing in, in some of the regions there are a lot of of residents that that share cultural community um, or cultural connection um, to, to workers too but I think that's kind of a, a key thing that is interesting in terms of looking at staffing right because even the community health centers noted one talked so much about having a social worker who was uh, from La from a Latinx country who spoke Spanish and just how useful that individual was based on language, but also cultural kind of connection, right? So looking at staffing initiatives uh, with people, outreach workers or, or clinicians that, that have that uh, connection, I think is, seems to be a best practice, uh, you know, coming from the US, um, but obviously in collaboration with, um, with other staff too, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's something that's why the yeah the University of Oregon program was very interesting to us uh, the Sabidura program um, it was very grounded in in psychology of Latinx migrant communities right and similarly Tescucho that Cynthia uh, coordinates or or um, the other initiative Watari they're so rooted in the experience of migrant communities and and so it's very much um so yeah it would be it would be great to um, I think. CMHA Windsor Essex is such a great example of kind of the merging of those two and in the report we we didn't uh, speak enough about it in in uh, in this presentation but in the report we we've tried to really uh, speak to it but CMHA Windsor Essex obviously Windsor Essex is one of the most you know it's the region with so many workers and they've really been outreaching um, and connected to the migrant worker community program and and really working with the community group that's very culturally informed and language informed and they're kind of merging their their resources and they produced you know videos uh, for workers uh, coming from CMHA information but contextualized to uh, to the community groups understanding of, of issues so I think that's also a, a really best practice that, that we identified. And if I could just add to that, Eduardo, in recognition of what you're identifying as one is sort of these cultural aspects of mental health and, and wellness, um, both as preventative and in times of crisis. 
And so that's also what we've, we've laid those kinds of considerations out in the report, but that also helps us think that migrant worker populations are comprised of distinct groups of people who also have different cultural needs. Um, and so that's why we took a very social determinants of health perspective, recognizing that for some communities, even the concept of mental health is so stigmatized that talking about recreation or religious services are a form of mental health. Um, so it, we did adopt this holistic perspective to mental wellness and psychosocial well-being um, to try and get at those things. But it also, like you're saying, it speaks to the targeted and unique needs of certain populations around mental health supports. I think that's important. Yeah, Thanks. and thank you so much. And I think this is going to be great for CMH and those organizations to know this information, right? So they can target more how are they going to be providing these services to these specific kind of communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swani. I see Loretta has a question. Do you want to unmute and turn on your camera? Hi, Eduardo. Hi, uh, Steph and Michelle. I think that's all I uh, only feel to say no. Um, I, I wanted to share with you, um, and I don't know if anybody else on this webinar is uh, part of the oral, Ontario Oral Health Alliance. Uh, or from the Alliance for Healthier Communities. Um, I wanted to share an experience I've had over the last decade, uh, at least decade, around oral health uh, advocacy. And I wondered if we could mirror a similar process for this community. Uh, because over the years, the um, we call it UHA, the Ontario Oral Health Alliance, has provided us with some key messages um, around advocacy, especially around election time, that we as community uh, partners can approach our own MPP with those same messages, but reflecting um, a local perspective. And it's been so easy to be part of that movement across Ontario. And as some of you may know, um, over the course of the last decade, uh, thresholds for eligibility for oral health have increased for uh, low-income adults. And most recently, uh, seniors were added to that program twice uh, in terms of el income eligibility. And that's been uh, the work of community health centers and organizations across Ontario, working together on that same message, but providing a local perspective to their local MPP. So I wondered if maybe Using a lot, because um, Steph, you have been in a lot of research, um, part of research, and with Eduardo and company, and I guess this is a ministry telling another ministry what to do, but uh, I understand the nuances of that. Uh, but I think as community organizations, it'd be very easy for us to go to our local MPP and share our story backed up by the research and the findings of reports such as this. And I, I thought maybe we could think about that moving forward. Um, and if you'd like to um, know a little bit more about um, what we've done over the past decade and the process, I'm happy to share that. Uh, we just had a meeting with Laurie Scott, our local MPP on this issue of oral health and identifying even more barriers that exist, even though we've made all this progress. So I think it's an ongoing thing. But as Michelle said, Ontario Health is not <laughs> listening to CHCs. So we need a different approach, perhaps. Um, and maybe this is one to consider. Thank you. That's great. That's a great. Yeah, it's very insightful in terms of it's it's finding points of influence and building community, I think, and the sense of community um, and uh, adding it, it, on many levels. So um, so that, yeah, I think that's really valuable. Um, if I may add, yeah. um, what really spoke to them is when Michelle, um, not Michelle, Jackie Maud from the Alliance um, brought to the forefront what it's costing uh, our healthcare system when people go to emergency departments for things that they should be getting uh, dealt with at a dentist's office. So when, when you speak in terms of money, Mm -hmm. and how much money is being lost. I guess for us, for this community, it'd be lives lost. Um, but the impact on perhaps the economy, I don't know. I don't know what the angle is, but we need to find that money 
uh, piece because money talks when you when you go to MPPs. Yeah, that's the age old business case uh, scenario that uh, it's it's a, sometimes a language that we have to learn as well. I think to mm -hmm. to be able to characterize things. maybe lost work. And that's not something that the study, this study looked at. I don't know if any of the research that you guys looked at in the literature, we didn't really talk about the literature um, as much today, but was there information about um, impact and, and that kind of thing in the literature? Mm -hmm. In terms of funding um, and to, to do, uh, no, no, we were really- uh, and harm, uh, related harm and costs to, to society, to to individuals, and their employers, and society, um, and healthcare systems, and all that. I just wondered if any of that had been um, like they say, mental health costs Canada fifty one billion dollars a year. That's someone's research, uh, and that's actually fairly old uh, research. Um, but I just wondered if there was any. Have you seen anything even from the U.S. in the studies there where they've tried to translate into? into a financial impact in order to, you know, have those dialogues that Loretta was talking about. I don't think so. I think most, and in the report, we, we kind of, cat we categorized the, the articles reviewed, and I think there was some on interventions um, and talked, but it was not at the level of, of, of funding so much as just the organization and, and, and uh, strategies of, of deploying either assessment in mental health with these communities or service provision. With these communities, but uh, but it's a it's a really good area. I wonder maybe we missed it with our our, our search, but I think it would be really important for sure. Um, yeah. Thanks. So we don't have any other. Oh wait, I see. I have a dot, but I have to go see if it's someone's hand up. Uh, um, oh, Michelle, you have your hand up again. You got something else to add? Yeah. Uh, so thanks so much, Loretta, uh, for bringing that up and um, that specific example. Uh, Again, great work by um, the Alliance and all the CHCs. Um, but this whole issue of looking at financial, um, the whole financial angle or accountability around lost time for work-related conditions, period, um, has not um, has not uh, gotten much win, shall we say? Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, what the response um, is uh, with. Like Omafra um, was funding this project and very involved in this, and um, I think that there is the the perception um, that uh, Omafra speaks for the employers, and I'm not sure exactly. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether there's any strategy um, related to that or not, um, but. Uh, Anyway, I think just the whole idea about looking at the financial discussion, like as I had said earlier about getting employers to um, go back to their MPs or go back to the Ministry of, of um, Health because they're paying um, employee health tax. Uh, many of them have huge numbers of workers and so they're paying big dollars for um, health care that their workers are not receiving. And then the whole issue about looking at lost productivity. Um, I, I don't believe I have seen anything in the research related to that, but extremely good question. Thanks. I was going to I was going to bring up one quick thing too, but I know that we're yeah, if, I know that we're over time. So if there anybody that that needs to go, we we want to provide a ability to do so without feeling pressured to stay. But if if uh, but it's great to have this extended discussion for sure. Um, I I just was going to bring something up quickly that I think that we didn't um necessarily I guess pull out as much in this presentation, but you know we really connected and had a great experience connecting with the University of Guelph team the, in the No team. Um, Myself and my colleague Leonor Cedillo, uh, who who um, wasn't uh, available today, um, met with them and uh, and just you know the importance of of the work being done around farmers' mental health is definitely part of this picture. And for us, it's very important to to connect to to the work that we're doing with international culture workers for a ver variety of reasons. But um, you know, the in the know itself, the training that they piloted um, and then the evaluation they did. On a practical level, it identified that employers who took the in the no training were more likely to be open to 
um, and be sensitized to the mental health concerns of others and be more willing to offer to maybe share information or, or dialogue with them. Um, so in our report, we talk about, you know, conceptually the, the, um, the benefit or the, the success of the, in the know and more employers taking the know, um, would create a sensitization theoretically at the workplace level of of the mental health of employees that they're hiring right um of course it, that training is 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 still restricted mostly to the farmer and the farm community but you know there's that potential to then broaden that to looking at who else is on the farm which would be would be employees including IWs, right um and it also is supportive because um of connecting you know discussing both and really looking at a mental health strategy for the agricultural industry, um, including among everybody part of it and having it, you know, talking about it in that level. Um, and that would also avoid perceptions of mental health of particular groups, almost like being pinned against each other or priorities for one overshadowing another. Like, I think that a move to really speak about the stressors, the, the, the stressors shared by most people involved in the industry and then particular stressors, maybe by managing a business to then being an employee experiencing various vulnerabilities due to, you know, um, social determinants of health. But I think that, you know, really connecting um, the experience of all, all uh, of, of employers and workers is important. And it's also going to be important when we actually try, and this is Oak Howell's kind of space to really try to get to workplaces and do some assessment of psychosocial factors at the workplace to actually be able, at least at the workplace level, change, um, you know, work processes to, to reduce harm, psychosocial harm, right? Um, and that's really going to be dependent at this point of the acceptance of an employer, right? To have organizations like ourselves or WSPS go on um, to the farm and that kind of mentality and that sensitization is going to have to, you know, we're going to really have to develop that to then be able to see types of interventions that are reported in the literature, like in the US um, or in Europe, right? Um, because right now in this context, I, I can definitely see, and we work with a lot of farmers and, and we work with farmers that are very open to, to resources and supports for workers they hire. Um, but what that does that look like, um, you know, across the board, because that's where I think the impacts, at least at the workplace level are going to happen, right? Is with the buy-in or through more evidence and, and identification of, of standards at the workplace that then are enforced, right? But if not, it's uh, how are we going to see those changes? Um, and I think in terms of the OCH Health perspective too, something that was really came out is when we asked community health centers what, um, you know, what health issues they were encountering the most among, among migrant agriculture workers, musculoskeletal issues were number one reported by all of the, the seven community health centers, right? Um, and they, and most of them identified, they were identified as work, work related. But in the conversation we were mentioning about WSIB and, and, you know, they noted that there's very little engagement with WSIB um, filing, yet they're seeing so many musculoskeletal issues related to work. So figuring out where does that go, right? And that's why in our, in our recommendations around funding, we, we talk about funding to primary healthcare services, having a lead that's a OCH Health kind of lead within that team to start trying to figure out a strategy around this, because if not, it's, you know, we've talked to health centers who feel like it's on a loop, right? They're, they're providing pain management or musculoskeletal um, but it's, it doesn't bridge the prevention of, of these issues. So it, it kind of can continue in a, a cycle of, of treatment um, when we know that musculoskeletal issues are, and in the literature, musculoskeletal issues are identified as, like it's not a surprise, right? Based on the work that people are doing. So I think more, more strategy around that needs to occur. That reminds me actually that I'm just typing one more thing in here that our Mayday Mayday uh, webinar series starts on Friday. Uh, and the um, the first session is actually on addictions and opioid mental um, opioid harm reduction and MSK injury and the masking of injuries is actually quite strongly related to uh, pain medication addiction, right? And uh, we didn't touch on that here. I think there's a bit in the report, um, but that's something else that people may uh, find. The discussion on Friday is from a uh, sort of a workplace uh, mental health perspective in terms of identifying factors in the workplace that can make a difference to prevention as, as is the whole series. And this, um, this um, report will also be part of the Mayday Mayday series in the last one um, at the end of May. So 
I think it is time to wrap up. I'm sure many of us have other meetings, but I just wanted to give each of the speakers to say thanks. Uh, thanks, especially for this uh, comprehensive and and um, important and you know signify significant uh, report, but also um, for putting together today's presentation and answering questions. And I guess I would just turn it over to each of you to see if you have anything final that you wanted to note based on your the sections that you presented or that you know we weren't able to include today that it's something else that you want to draw someone's attention to as we as we say goodbye so maybe i'll go i'll go in reverse order so i'll start with christina i'm not sure she's still here actually christine no maybe not so cynthia do you have anything that you'd like to say um just as a final words uh, well, I would like to thank everyone for their time and to make a space on their days to attend this webinar. Uh, it was a project that it took its time. It, uh, it <laughs> demanded a lot of um, effort and we don't, at least I don't want it to end here, like on a written report and um, archived somewhere like I would like to see that this uh, this project this efforts this uh, research and everything that the resources that were created help to actually improve the situation of these migrant farm workers here in Canada and that we can uh, walk towards that improvement together having the opinions and the feedback from all of the stakeholders having uh, these workers at the center. And so we can actually improve what uh, it's been done like throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much everyone for being here today. Thank you. How about you, Steph, did you? I would like to echo Cynthia with thanks to everyone for attending today. And I'd also just like to note and highlight the importance of the posters that were produced as a part of this project, the nine regional posters. One of the things that poses challenges to support groups every year is when they have ongoing relationships with workers who have come to their community for many years and then suddenly find themselves with no control of themselves in a new community completely alone and not aware of what services exist in that area. And so the posters that were produced as a part of this project can help individual workers navigate new regional environments, and they can also help community support groups work together and understand who is in different regions so that they can build capacity as their worker friends move between regions throughout the year. And so I just wanna say thank you to Eduardo and to Oka and Cynthia and the, and the rest of my project colleagues. It has been a great year working on this and I'm very pleased that today's webinar gave us the opportunity to present our findings to so many people. So thanks again. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, Eduardo, the last word. I've talked a lot already, but the, yeah, thank you very much for for everybody, and and again for recognizing Omafra and and the funding and their and seeking us out and and setting the priority to again get the the information the posters out as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I think. Um, I was just going to say that thank you to all of the, the community groups and the health centers and the legal clinics and the initiatives that spoke to us. Like, and I really, you know, the, the, the final report is such a large report and it's a bit overwhelming and we wrote it really quickly. So even the design of it could have been better in terms of jumping to sections or, or summarizing sections maybe better, but the interview sections really like when I was uh, looking over it they're really great insight from the interviews across all of the stakeholder groups, including uh, workers. So it, I, I really you know, thank all of those and then promote looking through that if it's not overwhelming for people. And, uh, and yeah, I'm I, I, similar to Cynthia. I hope that we can, we're going to let the dust settle a little bit, but then, you know, mobilize some of our findings to, to actionable uh, next steps. Definitely. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks everyone. So this uh, video or this uh, event has been live streamed on Facebook, so it will be available on Okao's Facebook page within probably about 10 minutes. Takes it a little while to render and then it's there and then we will provide um, um, a, maybe an edited version that will be up on the website along with the slides, which we should be able to post by today or maybe first thing tomorrow. So, it, and the slides will have the links as well. So um, thanks again for attending and thanks especially to the speakers and to the project team. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. And yes, we do have a webinar on Thursday, which I put in the chat um, that's looking at the investigation of deaths 
um, and what we can learn from from that with respect to in general and then also through the lens of the nine worker deaths that uh, happened in 2020 and uh, 2021. So hope to see some of you there to continue the conversation from a different perspective. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you.